fraternity prank. Also, the Pope decided today to release Vatican-related bath products. An incredible thing. Yes, it's the new Pope on the rope. It's right. Pope on the rope. Wash with it. Go straight Hello, to heaven. Thank Dr. you. Roach, and today, we are going to be discussing the book everybody seems to be discussing, namely, The Case for Christian Nationalism by author Stephen Wolf. And in particular, what I want to do today is I want to look at one little segment that came from this interview that was posted on X, where he had an interview with The Blaze discussing sort of his vision and understanding of Christian nationalism, what that looks like, and sort of what it doesn't look like. Now, I would actually commend you to go listen to the full interview. Obviously, we're just taking one segment out of it. And in particular, what I want to look at today is his answer to what is Christian nationalism. And you're going to find that he gives really a pretty straightforward answer, but it's an incomplete answer. And it's not just incomplete from my perspective. It's incomplete from some of the other things he's laid out in his book, The Case for Christian Nationalism. Now, before we dive into this, I just really want to say that, you know, one of my former mentors gave this advice years ago. He said, you always need to find things that are commendable in any author that you read. And in that, I want to extend that same thing to Stephen here. And I really do commend him for the work that he put into this book. And, you know, I may not agree with everything that he lays out here, And I may not agree in particular with many of the applications that he lays out in this book, but I do commend him and I commend him pretty significantly for the time and the effort that he put into this book. I really commend him for not using as much double speak as a lot of people would. In fact, I think he was very clear on what he tried to lay out here. And that's really a breath of fresh air within just sort of the broader pop evangelical world where everybody's living in Tim Keller double speak or gospel coalition double speak. So I really commend him for that. In fact, I think one of the reasons that he's had so much pushback and interaction is because he was clear in what he said. And that's just really an advice for all of us that we need to be clear in what we try to say. In addition, I'm really thankful that he tried to discuss many of the hard things. And I think there are far too many people today that try to shy away from those kinds of things. And I think that's really something that's respectable. And I think it's something that we should use as we're trying to do, whether political philosophy or we're trying to do apologetics or theology and all the rest is that we should try to engage and discuss hard things. Now, there are other things, you know, beside this book that I've actually found very commendable about Stephen. I'm very thankful that he's trying to work by dealing with our past and our heritage coming into the present day situation. There are far too many people who disregard original sources or their original sources stop up to a very particular point, whereas Stephen's drawing on this broad Western political philosophy. You can definitely tell that his background is in political philosophy. So I like that he's citing original sources. He's not just trying to be, you know, sort of innovative, like many of the other figures that we're dealing with. I also like that he is committed to many of the things that are given in the vision of the magisterial understanding of Christianity. In fact, I think if Stephen and I have anything that's very much in common, it's the use of realism their epistemology, the concepts of natural law, natural theology, and all the rest in that. And I think Stephen is 100% correct when he talks about that the Protestant sort of heritage as it relates to natural law and natural theology is that we can actually do natural theology and we have a natural law. There are far too many people today who are wholeheartedly committed to this idealistic method and this whole commitment to rogue forms of presuppositionalism that, you know, will totally disregard any concept of natural theology as some kind of man-made idol or something along those lines. We've all seen it. We know the guys that put that forth sort of historically within evangelicalism and within the broader sort of contemporary Protestant movement. And Stephen's right. I mean, our our heritage is that. Now, a lot of people don't like talking about, oh, the heritage of this movement or whatever. And, you know, Protestants aren't just blind traditionalists. And I think there's good exegetical reasons for affirming natural theology and all the rest. And that's sort of beside the point 
at this particular time. In addition, I'm also very thankful that Stephen desires to manifest and develop what I would call the virtues, both internally with a person and externally in a family and in society and as that might relate to government and all the rest. You know, there are far too many people today that give up on sort of the the virtue ethics tradition and they don't even see the concept of virtue needing to be put forth. Also, I'm just I'm very thankful that he is trying to set forth a vision for what it looks like to engage and actually engage local government and state government and federal government. And if we've learned anything over the past few years, it's the fact that these local and state and federal government sort of decrees, regimes, whatever they may be, can have significant effects in our life. And in particular, somebody who worked in the the whole realm of public policy, I served in that respect, working in public policy, that there are very few people who actually understand the fact that we need to engage in that arena. And I have traveled extensively trying to get people to be engaged on those matters, whether it's a school board or your local city council or the state level, whatever it is. And people are just frankly apathetic. So Stephen's not apathetic. However, what I want to do is I want to play this small segment of the video. I just want to lay it out. Again, I commend you, listen to the whole video. Go and I'll try to post a link to it in the description here. And what I want to say is this, is that when I first saw this book, I knew that there were going to be a lot of things in the theory of it that many people were going to agree with. And I knew that many people were going to disagree with his layout of issues related to natural law and so forth. But what I figured a lot of the debate was going to center around was his concept of whatever the Christian prince was going to be, like before I approached it, and then understanding what the Christian prince ended up becoming. In addition to it, I knew it was going to be in the application of it. I knew that's where the rubber was going to meet the road. And I actually have thought to myself and wondered if there would have been as much pushback if the application sections just weren't in this book, if he just would have like laid out this theory with the book and then laid out another book at a later date with more application. That's me just thinking, sort of wondering about it in and of myself. Now, there are also some you know, key issues with many people as it relates to this book. I have issues with some of the, the intellectual theory of this book. But some of the other issues that I've noticed is, is that it's not just this book that's created so much of the controversy. You know, Stephen, I think, has been probably a main target because he's laid out such a clear case for what he believes on this. But there are other people that are sort of in the circles of Christian nationalism and even some of them within, you know, Stephen Wolf's circles that he's worked with who are saying very problematic things where, you know, they're saying things on social media or in other settings where you just go, this stuff is crazy. And this is where you're starting to see that it's not just a discussion about Stephen's book. It's a much larger discussion about narrative arcs and how it's being used politically by both the left and the right and for other motives that people are trying to discuss. And if you want to see more on that, just go and listen to the interview that I did with Jenna Ellis. Go look at the presentation that I gave with Sovereign Nations. I think we lay out a lot of them there. I know Stevens interacted with them. I sort of listened to part of it, but and to be honest, I felt like the interaction specifically to the Jenna Ellis video was a long ramble. And I didn't finish it because, frankly, time is short, life is short, and all the rest. So the essence of what I want you to see today, though, as we interact with this, is that I want you to note that he lays out sort of a soft, nice version of Christian nationalism in this video. And he talks about other things in the longer video, but in this particular section, he lays out just one idea that he's getting at, one slice of the pie. And what I want to do is play it. And then just give some quotes that he gives. I don't want to have any commentary related to them. I just want you as the listener of this to say, is what he's saying in the video matching some of the applications of what his view is going to be in the book? 
In addition, before we dive into that, I want us to just notice where I'm going to start dealing with this going forward and how I'm going to start dealing with this is that, you know, when we look at the big picture of this, you know, the bigger sort of, of genus of what's going on here is various forms of integralism and many would almost say, you know, authoritarianism or totalitarianism and all these different things. And his book is one particular species of that. And for me going forward related to this conversation, I don't want to just keep discussing Stephen Wolf endlessly. I would rather deal with the bigger genus situation and the species issues can sort of come up as they may. But with that, there are many people within this broader integralist movement who recognize Christian nationalism as a form of integralism. In particular, you know, Andrew Torba comes right out and says, you know, Christianity is integralism and Christian nationalism is integralism. You can just go read his book on it. And in addition to it, I think there's been a lot of good work to show that Wolf's book is sort of this mix of Hegel's political philosophy. You see that in John Wilsey's work on this mixed with varying forms of integralism. And ironically, integralism is more based within sort of that dialectical philosophy. And I don't even think he's a full blown dialectical theologian. I don't think he is at all in particular, but integralism is within that and within that broader tradition, but it's actually more of a Roman Catholic theology. So what I honestly see some of the things going on is that you see a, a mixture of Hegel's political philosophy with Catholic integralism refracted through the magisterial reformers. And I think somebody who lays that out probably the most clear is John Wilsey in his book review of this particular book on Christian nationalism. So if you want more longer presentations on that, see my longer presentation with sovereign nations. Now with this, I just want to transition here and I want to just pull this up and we'll play it and then we will look at a few quotes and I will let you decide what you think. Spiritual, but no, but it's just attend uh, uh, worship on Sunday. Uh, that's the, the first number one. Because I, I think in the end, what Christian nationalism, to my mind, it's not about taking America back for God. It's not, I mean, th there are aspects of that, but it's ultimately, we want a nation where people are encouraged culturally um, to worship God. Like that's, that's in the end what it's about. Uh, it's, it's not about like uh, just, you know, taking dominion for dominion's sake. So I think that that's it. Uh, the second thing is um, the commitment to the spiritual health of um, a family. Uh, it's something all we, we can all um, definitely speak to ourselves and do better. Uh, that I think that's those are the, the first two things. And I don't say that just to be pious. I, and in that, I think I would agree with him. I, I don't know any person who would name the name of Christ who doesn't say that a person who's trying to follow Jesus Christ should be actively engaged in the church and raising a healthy family that's beneficial to society. I, I don't know anybody who would say that that's a negative thing, but that's an incomplete understanding of what is Christian nationalism. You know, I have all sorts of failures myself, but I think that's where it begins. Uh, but that's still not sufficient for a political movement, even though it's essential for it. Um, and and uh, so, but, but from there, I think that Christians need. I think also just briefly related to that. One of the things that I do find commendable in Stephen's work is that he recognizes given that long sort of virtue ethics tradition is that, you know, it starts in the individuals. It starts within the family and then it manifests itself in other areas. You see that so much laid out in really the classic political philosophies. In particular, I think of like Aristotle's work on politics and how those things are shaping and governing in that regard. So in that sense, I don't think there's anything to critique with what he said. But notice, again, as we look at the quotes later, I think it's incomplete on what his full vision is. We need to get together uh, within like no local networks, people within trusted groups, perhaps in your church, uh, not just online, but in local groups where they can talk about these things and see how they can, they can act kind of locally. That's at the very local level and the very personal level. And then, and then from there um, and, and elsewhere, I think also encourage the states to as assert their power. Um, in our federal system, the states have. The, 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 
I like to tell people that the power of our states, in terms of political power, it is uh, it is curtailed because of the federalism, because of the powers of the federal government. But that power isn't derived from the federal government. As if, yeah, I mean, that, that the power of the state governor and the state legislature comes from the people. They vote in the legislature. They vote in the governor. Um, the governor is not delegated from the president or, con- or U.S. Congress. Um, that's your state legislature. That is your um, that, that is your governor. And so they have power, and I think they should act uh, accordingly uh, and act with that power. Don't don't think of themselves as delegated from the federal government, um, which could at times mean resisting things that are unjust at the federal level. Um, so that that's just. You know, those are the two things. Act locally. So, you know, worship God, uh, act locally with uh, and and meet with fellow like-minded believers. So initially you have to ask yourself this question. If that's all that people were talking about as it relates to Christian nationalism, would we have such a pushback about it? Would people be discussing his book the way that they're discussing it if it was just about that? We both know the answer. No. And. Of across of, of across the nominations and all that, and then encourage states to be to use their power um, properly. Show up at church. That's like the the Woody Allen option, right? Life <laughs> is, life is ninety percent showing up. Yeah. So again, that was the initial presentation there, and I think what you saw online is that there was a lot of different, you know, pushback about it. I immediately said this is just an incomplete answer. And I think other people recognized it was an incomplete answer. So what I want to do next is I just want to transition here and I just want to pull up a few quotes. And I really want you to just ask yourself if that jives with what the application of it is in other areas, because a lot of the people, myself included, who have concerns about Christian nationalism, it's not just the the cultivation of virtue or the cultivation of the family and all these different things. And we realize that there's sort of this this movement that's going on where when the things we're going to discuss get talked about, they go, oh, no, no. And they were sort of retract back to sort of the more easy to discuss the the virtuous, the the things that are going to grab the heartstrings a little bit more of people as it relates to Christian nationalism. So with no further ado, let's just transition here. And I just want to look at a few of these slides and these come from my presentation that I gave with sovereign nations. And some of the big issues that I have with it are issues relating to the compulsion of religion and what that means as a state enforcing its state's ability or whatever he would say in that regard. So let's just look at these in this regard. So he says, first of all, the question is whether a Christian magistrate having civil rule over a civil society of Christians may punish with civil power false teachers, heretics, blasphemers, and idolaters for their external expressions of such things in order to prevent, one, any injury to the souls of the people of God, two, the subversion of Christian government, Christian culture, or spiritual discipline, or three, civil disruption or unrest. So notice the key things that he's trying to say here. He's asking this question whether a civil society of Christians can use civil power against somebody that they deem as a false teacher, heretic, blasphemer, or idolater. Okay, does that jive with what he just said about Christian nationalism before? In addition, suppressing false religion in one's own land can be called a holy war, for the intended effect is the elimination of sacrilege. In our time, the suppression of false religion is not an end in itself, but a means and matter of prudence. And such actions are prudent only if they conduce concretely to the good of the church. So some of the things that you got to see here is, is that it really is this idea of a holy war or this intended effect of the elimination of sacrilege. And just ask yourself, Does that jive with what we have understood as the freedom of religion, given what we've seen within our American past? And, you know, within his broader interview that he had with the Blaze, he's going to say that there are two different definitions of religious freedom, one with the founders and one that we have now. And I think people are, you know, they need to have the discussion about this. But again, is that what he said in the the two minute clip on what is Christian nationalism? Does that sort of jive with the other comments that he's making within this book? Namely, that we need to have this holy war 
aspect in the way that we eliminate sacrilege. And we know what this has looked like even in the past few weeks. I mean, think about Iowa and the state capitol building and the way that so many people associated with the Christian nationalist movement were behind what Cassidy was doing within the building, going in and hacking the head off of the idol. In fact, if you want my longer discussion about that, go check out my YouTube channel on it. But yeah, again, let's just keep going here. He says this, as I argue below, false religion is a crime against God and it can cause harm to one's fellow man. Hence, one can reject the view that magistrates ought to punish the dishonoring of God and still coherently affirm that magistrates can restrain false religion in the interest of public good. All depends on who's in control, though. In addition, all appropriate civil action against false religion is directed at its external expression in order to suppress external false religion and thereby prevent harm to the public, both to souls and to the body politic. Suppressing false religion is a means, not an end in itself. Thus, the question is not whether the suppression of external false religion by civil government is a good in itself or ought to be pursued for its own sake, nor is it the question whether civil government ought to prosecute all expressions of false religion, regardless of of their consequences and circumstances, nor is the question whether the civil or whether civil power can force one to speak outwardly what is true, for that would cause one to lie. Let's keep going here. We can expect a Christian magistrate having this inscripturated clarification to understand the most basic principles of man's duty in natural religion and to know what clearly violates those duties, namely one. Atheism, polytheism, and idolatry. Two, strange and profane rites. Three, blasphemy and sacrilege. And four, the profanation of the Sabbath. These principles and their violations should be indisputable to a Christian magistrate, since they are known by natural reason and conscience and clarified in Scripture. Therefore, a Christian magistrate has good and confident or confidence epistemic ground to act against those who violate natural religion. He goes on to say this, as we look a little further here, and presumably the Christian magistrate, though not a theologian, would be no regular Christian, but educated. He is therefore in a good and confident position to decide between disputes as to fundamentals of doctrine. Thus, a godly civil government or godly civil magistrate will have competence to decide what pertains to mere orthodoxy. In addition to this, one of those principles of the inclusion exclusion is the primacy of Christian peoplehood. And so Christian nationalism will exclude at least the following from acceptable opinion and action. And this is where a lot of the debate starts to come in. Political atheism. Two, the subversion of public Christianity. Three, opposition to Christian morality. Four, heretical teaching, and five, political and social influence of non-Christian religion and its adherents. What does this look like? What about the freedom of speech, he says? We could look at Wolf states, of course, the range and type of diversity allowed is a matter of prudence and collective experience. The purpose here is not to stifle public debate, but to maintain conditions for public debate to serve a Christian people. Public debate is a means, and as such, it ought to conduce to what is good. I Affirm, therefore, that there ought to be freedom of speech and, as with all societies and institutions, that freedom must be bounded prudently such that public discourse conduces to what is good. In addition to this, he goes on to say this, as I've said, the magistrate, as magistrate, has no interest in heretical belief itself as an inward error, but only public heresy, the outward expression of error, the belief itself harms no one except the man who holds it, which is a matter between him and God. But public heresy has the potential to harm others' souls by causing doubt or distraction or by disrupting public peace. The magistrate who must care for the souls of his people may act to suppress that heresy. The Reformed tradition has a long and widely acknowledged practice of ministers admonishing and disputing with heretics prior to magistrates exercising the sword. Now, notice what he goes on to say here. Arch heretics are publicly persistent in their damnable error and 
actively seek to convince others of this error to subvert the established church, to denounce its ministers, or to instigate rebellion against magistrates. Sorry about that. Lost my place there. For this reason, they can be justly put to death. This is not to say that capital punishment is necessary. Soul or desired punishment, banishment, and long-term imprisonment may suffice as well. So what I want you to see here is just look at this. He lays out a whole case of the figures that he thinks are going to fulfill this arch heretics, whether it's blasphemers or atheists or any of the rest like this. And I just really want you to look at and ask yourself this question. Does that jive with the expression and the definition of Christian nationalism that he gave it in that particular clip. No. Ask yourself why there's the play back and forth between what's laid out here and what's in that clip. In addition, ask yourself this question. Do you want to live in a society that will banish, imprison, or possibly even perform capital punishment on an individual who fulfills these definitions of an art or arch heretic presented within society. That's why so many people have significant concerns about Christian nationalism. It's the practical effects of it, what it's going to do to constitutional liberties, what it's going to do to the freedom of religion, what it's going to do to the freedom of speech, and what that's going to mean if they're in power or if they set up a government like this and they're no longer in power and somebody else is in power and what they're going to do to other people. So in short, you know, this is not a full-blown response to everything. I lay out so much more of this in other presentations, but what I want you to see here is, is while there are many commendable things with Stephen as Stephen and many of the things that he tries to do with the concept of virtue ethics and how he's trying to revive the concept of political philosophy, we need to be concerned when we see these kinds of issues related to Christian nationalism. It's not just, we love our family and we try to be virtuous, we try to go to church and all the rest. You have to deal with quotes like this, namely, that is not to say that capital punishment is necessary, sole or desired punishment. Banishment and long-term imprisonment may suffice as well. I have concerns with that. And I think that's one of the many concerns beyond just the, the practical applications, but as it relates to full-blown integralism, religious freedom, constitutional liberties, and so forth. So again, thank you. If you like this, please like, subscribe, and share. Thank you. 10,000 years will give you such a trick in the neck.